So today we are in Jonah chapter 2, verses 6 through 10. And I know that might seem a little awkward because we've been in the book of Exodus and then the book of Leviticus, and then we did an Easter series. And now we're not even starting at the beginning of Jonah, but we're jumping into the middle of chapter 2. And it's a little more awkward because in the middle of chapter 2, all of chapter 2 is Jonah's prayer to God. However, I did this for two reasons. One, I have to be honest, um, I have a Hebrew class in seminary, and this was the passage that I was assigned to preach on for tomorrow. So I will be giving a sermon on this text, similar to this sermon, tomorrow in class. Um, but the second reason, Jonah's life and testimony in this account pictures that of the Lord Jesus. Jesus later in the Gospels applies the sign of Jonah to his own ministry when, he, when the Pharisees are seeking for a sign later on in the Gospel accounts. Jesus said, I'm not going to give you a sign except that of the sign of Jonah. In the same way that Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the earth three days and three nights. Jesus takes this account in the book of Jonah and applies it to himself. And we look at this, and it's pretty obvious just from looking at it. That's not really a sign, that's not really a prophecy, but Jesus says that it was a prophecy, it was a sign, and he applies it to his own ministry. And so we're going to be jumping into his prayer in chapter 2. Last week was Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. Jesus rose from the grave. He died, was buried, and he rose out of the tomb. And the same thing that's pictured in the book of Jonah is that Jonah, even though he was rebellious, Jesus was never rebellious, but Jonah was figuratively thrown into the grave, the watery grave, swallowed, or died, swallowed up by the fish, and then spit out onto dry land. So there's that, that's what Jesus is doing then whenever he gets into the gospel accounts, applying that to his ministry. He's showing that uh, in the same way that Jonah kind of died, was a picture of death, was in the grave, and then resurrected out of the sea. That's the same as Jesus. So let's dig in. We're going to jump in and read all of chapter 2, just for context, but then we're going to focus on the last half, verses 6 through 10. So let's read. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the valley of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice, for you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life, the deep surrounded me, weeds were wrapped about my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit. O oh Lord, my God, when my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you, into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love, but I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. So here's a, an overview of, of where we're at in the account. There's two nations specifically in focus here. There's Israel, which is God's people, and then there's the, the in Jonah's mind, the evil nation of Assyria. So they are the conquering empire, the supreme world power that has come in and taken Israel captive. A couple centuries before the book of Jonah, Israel went through a terrible civil war, and it split the nation into two pieces. So you have the northern kingdom of Israel, and the southern kingdom of Judah. Jonah is a prophet and a citizen to the northern kingdom. And Assyria has come in and has taken the northern kingdom captive. So the northern kingdom is forced every year to pay taxes to Assyria. They are subservient to their rule. And so Jonah sees them as a threat. Jonah sees them, since they're the enemy of God's people, thus in his mind they're the enemy of God. Well, God tells Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach the gospel to them. And Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria. And so in the same way that 
any message that comes out of our capital, Washington, D.C., then goes to every state all throughout our empire, uh, the same would be true of Assyria. God wants his message to go directly to the top of the Assyrian nation so that word would spread throughout the entire empire. Well, Jonah doesn't want to do that. He says no, so instead of going to Nineveh, instead of going to Assyria, he runs the other way to Joppa, a, a port city, pays the fare for a ship that's going to Tarshish. And at this time, Tarshish is probably one of the furthest places in the known world that you get to. And so they're going on the Mediterranean Sea, and while they're somewhere in the middle of the sea, God hurls a great storm, which culminates in Jonah being thrown overboard. And as he's, as soon as he hits the water, he, the waves and the billows all uh, engulf him, surround him, push him under the currents, pulling him down. And on the surface, the sea is quiet. The wind and the storm cease. Yet Jonah's being pulled down, and this is his reflection, this is his prayer, as he's being pulled underwater. And he's fainting away, he's passing out of consciousness, but it's the last breath that he has. It's his last thought as he prays a prayer to God. Now this isn't the prayer, he probably prays something like, God save me. But this is the prayer then, when after he wakes up, at some point within those three days that he's in the fish, he prays this prayer to God, because he recognizes that God did save him. He didn't actually die. Before we get into verse 6, though, let's just ask two questions. One, when do we typically try to get our lives in order? And how do we tend to pray for those who mistreat us? So try to personalize those. When do you typically try to get your life in order? And how do you tend to pray for those who mistreat you, who abuse you, who take advantage of you? Because we all have people like that in our lives. So today we're going to be using the, the GPS method. This is this is my outline, actually. So I'm going to state it, and then we'll restate it as we're walking through the passage. So GPS, grave, prayers, and salvation. So the grave is conquered by the Lord alone. And I'm going to restate these, but verse 6, the grave is conquered by the Lord alone. Verses 7 through 8, our prayers go up to the Lord alone. Our prayers go up to the Lord alone. And salvation belongs to the Lord alone. Salvation belongs to the Lord alone. That's verses 9 through 10. So GPS is the global positioning system, but today it means the gospel positioning system. So God is trying to get Jonah to see the gospel. And so verse 6 starts at 7. And there's a, there's a lot of poetic language here, and that, there's a reason for that, because it's uh, it's, a, it's a, a song, a prayer. Jonah is using poetic language. This isn't like a normal thing that we would read in the New Testament. But he talks about verse 6 at the very beginning, at the roots of the mountains. And if you think about a normal flower, you have the, the petals and everything on top, the stem that goes down the middle, and then what's at the very bottom? The roots. And so as Jonah's sinking down, he's being pulled underwater by the current, he's sinking down, he's going to the sea floor, all the way down to the bottom of the sea, a place where he's basically dead. Apart from God, he would have died that day. We never would have had this account. But as Jonah possibly is fading and out of consciousness, prays one last prayer, God, God save me. Even though he doesn't deserve it, he prays that prayer. He's been running from God, but he prays that prayer, and God actually does save him in a weird way. But God sends a fish to swallow him up. And he wakes up at some point in the belly of a fish for three days and three nights. That's where he's spending his time. And he has some, uh, a Jesus moment, a come to Jesus moment that he has. Um, so the roots are the bottoms of the mountains. So just as they go into the sea, the bottom of the sea floor. And it gets into whose bars, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O oh Lord my God. The roots of the mountains, the bars, the pit, this is all terminology, poetic language that the ancient world and also the Old Testament would see as, as imagery or a picture of death. And so bars, uh, for one instance, just like today, they are meant to either ensure protection and security or judgment and inescapability. 
And so some people put bars on their window, why? To protect them from outside things, and then also prisons and jails have bars for judgment purposes, you can't escape this. Well, in the Old Testament, I found seven different things that bars can be used for. A bar is typically a strong, long, and thick beam of wood that would be used to secure a gate. It doesn't have to be wood, it could be bronze or iron, but it usually is in reference to securing a gate. And the symbolism that Jonah was using then was that he, he was at his end. He had met his end. The bars of death were before him. There's no escape. No one escapes death. And so the first one, though, is, is an anomaly. It's, it's in reference to the tabernacle. It says in Exodus 26, You shall make bars of acacia wood, five for the frames of the one side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the frames of the other side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the frames of the side of the tabernacle at the rear westward. The second one is fortified cities. So these were cities that the nation of Israel, God had brought them into the wilderness, and they were now about to go into the land. But while they were in the wilderness, there were different cities that they came in contact with that had large gates and bars. These were fortified cities that Israel was unable to conquer on their own. But God ended up coming through for them. Deuteronomy 3.5 says, All these were cities fortified with high walls, gates, and bars. Bars securing the gates. It's used as a blessing of great strength to Asher. Deuteronomy 33.25 says, Your bars shall be iron and bronze, and as your days, so shall your strength be. When David was fleeing from Saul, King Saul uh, saw that David had run into a city that was surrounded by gates and bars. And so King Saul said in 1 Samuel 23, 7, God has given, me in, given him into my hand, for he has shut himself in by entering a town that has gates and bars. Protection, security, but also judgment and escapability. These are common themes that are being taken from the Old Testament. During Solomon's reign, it says in 1 Kings 4.13 that there were 60 great cities with walls and bronze bars that served Israel. Bars surrounding the sea. In Job chapter 38, 8-11, God says, Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I make clouds its garment, and thick darkness its swaddling band, and prescribe limits for it, and set bars and doors, and said, Thus far you shall come, and no farther, and there and here shall your proud ways be saved. So the picture is that we don't have to worry about how far the ocean is going to come in, lakes, rivers, ponds. God has set barriers and bars around each of those bodies of water. They can only come so far. God has determined how far things can go. And last but not least, the first time in Scripture, as far as I'm aware, that bars is used in relation to death is in Job 17. Job chapter 17, verses 15 through 16 says, Where then is my hope? Who will see my hope? Will it go down to the bars of Sheol? Shall we descend together into the dust? So Sheol was just the, the Hebrew term uh, they used in the Old Testament. basically meant the place of the dead. But Job uses bars as a symbol of death. And that's significant because even though Job doesn't come until uh, about right here in the Bible, Job, chronologically, is, is probably the first book that was written in Scripture. It's the oldest book of the Bible. And so the very first reference, then, chronologically speaking, in our time, is that bars were used as a reference to death. Because no one escapes death. No one comes back from the dead. These great cities that Israel came up against, they had gates and bars. They could not penetrate. They were impenetrable. But God overcame both of those things. He overcame death, he overcame those cities, he overcame everything that we see in the Old Testament. With Jonah, Jonah was meant to die that day, but God saved him. Through kind of a weird way, but God sent a fish to swallow him up. And it's out of word chronologically, just because of this passage, but if you look at the context, what happens first? Jonah prays. 
asks God to save him, prayer and confession. Then he figuratively dies, dies to self, dies to sin. Remember, Jonah was going his own way. He didn't want God. He, he wanted to do his own thing. And then, resurrection life, salvation. Jonah, at the very end of this passage, was spit out onto the dry land. There was, there was a type of resurrection life that Jonah experienced. So it's the same thing with today. God still works through the same order of salvation. We cry out to God in need of salvation. We die to self and to sin, and we're raised to life. All of this is found in the New Testament. This is the same order, same picture that we see all throughout the Bible. We cry out to God, recognizing our need for Him. He saves us by representing us in Christ's death and in Christ's resurrection. And so why did God rescue Jonah? He rescued Jonah because Jonah asked him to. Right before that, he says, I called out, this is verse 1, or verse 2, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. So Jonah, as he's sinking down, last prayer, God saved me. And now this, after he's woken up to the fish, at some point during the three days, this was his prayer. So God, what God did for Jonah was a merciful, a merciful response to what Jonah had done, what he had said. And so do you believe that God can save you? God has the power to save you. He may not always save us in the same way. He saved Jonah, Jonah by a fish. He did save us in, in weird kind of ways like that because he's creative. But God has the power to do what no one else could ever think of. And so that's the first one. The grave is conquered by the Lord alone. Jonah was being lowered basically to his grave, but God raised him up. And so this next one, prayer goes up to the Lord alone. Verse 7, when my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. When Jonah's life is, again, reflecting on what had just happened, his life was fainting away, but he remembered the Lord. He called out to the Lord, and his prayer went to God in his holy temple. Now, every other nation in the world, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, every other nation in the world had temples, but all of their temples were always empty. All of their, all of their temples were always empty, whereas Israel's temple in Jerusalem was always filled until God left it, because the true God of the universe filled and dwelt the temple. He was in the holy place. And if the same is true for their idols. Their idols were just, I, I bought this when I was a, a kid at a store in a mall, uh, just a tribal store, and I don't know, they weren't exactly like this, but you, you have to imagine that the Old Testament ancient people worship things like this. Throughout the Old Testament, you see even King David, the one that we hold up, the one that we exalt as the righteous king of Israel, had at one point household idols, things that their own little g gods that they would set up in order to bring them uh, health, wealth, prosperity, and anything that they wanted. They wanted their farms to grow, they wanted their marriage to go well, different things. They would set up these household gods. Again, it wasn't exactly like this, but what, what is this? This is just a piece of wood. There's nothing to this. This is lifeless. And that's, if you look at verse 8, those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. It looks kind of out of place at first. Though, because Jonah's praying, and all of a sudden he gets into those who forsake. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But what Jonah's doing, he's attributing his salvation to God. God is the one who saved him. And then he's saying that everyone else who prays to any other God is forsaking hope, is forsaking love, is forsaking goodness, because their gods are nothing more than wood and rock, compacted earth. They can't do anything for you. They're lifeless. The Hebrew word for vain idols is, is those who honor vapors of wind, or those who honor empty breaths, or one scholar said, those who honor empty nothings. There's nothing to them. So not only are the worshipers literally wasting their breath, calling out to these things to save them for help, but these are empty. There's nothing here. Now in the New Testament, Paul says that behind the idols that people worship, there's demonic influences and demonic powers. 
But again, this is just a piece of wood. This is not a God. There's only one God, and he's Jehovah, Yahweh, the one who builds Israel's temple. So whereas all the other temples in the world during the ancient times were, were filled with people, I mean, they, they had priests and their own prophets going in and out and performing the services and doing all the rituals and sacrifices. But otherwise, it was empty. There was no God for them. But Israel's temple, yeah, they had priests and prophets and people going in and out. But their temple was filled. And so in Jonah's mind, that's what he's thinking about. When he sends up his prayer to God, when he prays, God, save me, his prayer goes through the waters, across the miles, and all the way back to the temple where Yahweh, where Jehovah, where God is dwelling in Israel. God has not abandoned his people, but God is ever present with them. Even though Jonah was abandoning God by trying to go to Tarshish, God did not abandon him. God actually pursued him, chased after him. Again, it's kind of a weird scenario, but God did that for a purpose. Because as much as it, as it was God's mission to save Nineveh, he had the same goal of saving Jonah, saving Jonah's life. And so as we... Continue in verses 7 through 8. Jonah's life, remember, fainting away, passing out of consciousness, offers his prayer up to God. God hears him in the same way we read in our call to worship, Psalm 139. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I go from your presence? If I go down to Sheol, or the place of the dead, you are there. If I go to the bottoms of the seas, you are there. If I go to the highest heaven, you are there. Jonah is likely remembering verses like that, passages like the doctrines like that, that you can't escape this God. So not only is he in the temple, but he's everywhere present. He's also the God of the Mediterranean Sea, where Jonah was. He's also the God who exists in Assyria, because he's the only true God of the universe. And Jonah recognized that he couldn't escape. He couldn't escape God. So God is not only far, but he is near as well. Verse 8, again, sounds a little out of place, but that's what Jonah is doing. And this is the very middle of the book. And the reason this is pretty important is because this book is about salvation. That would be one of the things that you could summarize this book in. So when, when God first interacts with Jonah, he wants Jonah to go to Nineveh, ultimately for the purpose of salvation, the salvation of Nineveh. Jonah runs because at the end of the book, we, real, we find out that when Nineveh repents of their sins and God saves them, he relents from the disaster that he was going to bring upon them. Jonah's mad and he tells God, this is why I didn't want to go to Nineveh, because I knew you were good, because I knew you were going to save them. I knew you were going to rescue these people and I didn't want you to. That's what Jonah says in the last chapter. So it's about salvation for the Ninevites. When Jonah paid the fare, got on the ship, got on the boat, all of the people, when Jonah was asleep in the boat at the very bottom and the storm was raging, all of the sailors on the ship were calling out to their gods, little g gods, their wood, stone, rocks, everything that couldn't save them because there's nothing here. There's no life to this. There is no salvation in a piece of wood. But they were calling out to all the wrong things for salvation. But salvation was not coming. However, when they bring out Jonah and they find out that Jonah's the culprit, he's the problem, and he's the reason why everything is going wrong, Jonah says, I'm a Hebrew. I serve the God who made heaven and earth, the seas and the dry land. And it says they're terrified when he said this. The men were exceedingly afraid. That's chapter 1, verse 10. They're exceedingly afraid because they know of this God. They have heard this is the God who brought Israel out of Egypt. This is the God who actually answers mankind. This is the God who actually has life, opposed to all of these other little G gods who aren't gods at all, but just wood and stone and anything that man can craft up. But Yahweh is actually God, and he brings salvation with him. And so this whole book is about salvation. God saved Jonah. And this picture then is applied to Jesus' ministry in the Gospel accounts. 
When Jesus applies it to himself, three days and three nights in the, in the belly of the earth, in the place of the dead, Jesus rises from the dead, as we saw last week, Easter morning resurrection and salvation is offered to the Gentiles. And it's important to note that even as Jonah ran from God, he was supposed to go this way to Nineveh, he ran this way, and after Jonah was thrown into the sea, and the sea calmed and the storm died, the sailors of that ship, who weren't believers, they sacrificed to the true God because of his power and because he saved them. So Jonah, quite possibly, even through his disobedience, led these people to the Lord. And then, as we're going to see, he kind of gets right before God, and then he goes to Nineveh and leads them to the Lord, an entire city of 120,000 people. And you have to give Jonah a little bit of grace because, again, he's in the northern kingdom of Israel. They're subservient to the, the Assyrian rule. They see them as the threat. If Jonah were to come back to Israel and say, I was used by God to lead them to faith in God, he would be seen as a traitor to all of the people. Benedict Jonah, that's probably what they would call him. And so we have to give him a little bit of grace for his reaction. But at the same point, now, he gets into his prayer. It looks like he's having a change of heart. And he continues on with verse 9. But with the voice of thanksgiving, I will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. Salvation belongs to the Lord. So we have the grave is conquered by the Lord alone. Prayer goes up to the Lord alone. Prayer, again, this is lifeless. So prayers, you can offer them, but nothing's going to happen. It doesn't go anywhere. But our prayers to God, they go up to Him alone. And then finally, salvation belongs to the Lord alone. Salvation belongs to the Lord alone. So Jonah apparently made a vow during this time, but recognizing that God had saved him. This gives him reason for celebration. Even though, while he's praying this, while he's saying this, he's still in the belly of the fish. He's still, like, suffering all of the slimy, wet insides of the fish, weeds wrapped around his head still. Kind of reminds me of Geppetto and, and Pinocchio, but there's, it's nasty in there. He's confined. Think of the smells. Think of sweating and just all of the, the water coming in, all of how dirty he is. But he's still suffering the pains of this life, yet he has reason to celebrate. And so I, I think that's a picture of what we need to remember. And I know I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but think about this. If you're a believer in Christ, if you're a Christian, you have positionally been represented in Christ's death. So Christ died, well, positionally, you died too. You didn't die physically, but you died in his death. And as a believer, you've also been raised to life. Ephesians says that God has raised us up with Christ in the heavenly places. But you guys are right here. And I'm right here. So how are we in the heavenly places? We're not in the heavenly We're in Blue River Community Church building. Like That's where we're at right now. We're not in the heavenly places. But positionally, we are. Because we're represented in Jesus Christ. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God in the heavenly places. We're represented in Him. So we haven't fully experienced, as believers, we haven't fully experienced resurrection life yet. That's coming. But positionally, we have. And even though we're still going through this life, the suffering, the trials, the pain, uh, the afflictions that we face, we still have a lot of reason to praise the Lord, to celebrate, to thank the Lord. And Jonah did that with, with thanksgiving, I will sacrifice to you. I will come to you with thanksgiving. And so then Jonah, verse 10, was released from the belly of bondage. That's where he was, that's where he was confined, where he was located. And again, he was rescued in a really weird way. A, a fish came in, swallowed him up. And I don't 
don't know about science, the science behind that or whatever, but the point is that this was a miracle of God. It doesn't matter if there was a fish that exists that could swallow someone up and they could survive. No one comes back from the dead, yet Jesus did. Jesus walked on water. Jesus raised people from the dead, cured people of incurable diseases. Like That's the point of a miracle. God is outside of those. He controls those. He's supreme. He's the ruler. He's the God of the universe. And so he could make a fish to swallow Jonah up that would allow him to survive for three days and three nights. And so God is in charge of salvation. Salvation belongs to him. So he's in charge of the who, the why, the when, the where, and the how. Jonah didn't get to decide whether or not God would save the Ninevites. God decided that. Jonah didn't get to decide, you know, as he's fainting away, being sucked under, pulled under the water. He didn't say, Lord, save me by a fish. That probably wasn't even on his radar. But he cried out for salvation, and God saved him in a creative way that he chose. And so God is in charge of salvation because it belongs to him. He gets to choose the way, the method, and the who. And so we have to remember that. So apart from God, Jonah would have died this day. We never would have had this account. We never would be reading from it. But we're reading from it because Jonah didn't die that day. God raised him kind of literally from the dead. He would have died that day, but God raised him up out of the water. And this is a this is actually the only sermon I've ever given with two possible outlines. So I'm going to give the second one that I I chose not to use, but I thought I would use it at, as just a point at the last part of it. So in terms of your music preference, Jonas was rap. His like praise music was rap, and I say that because he recognized, acknowledged, and praised. That's, that's what he did in this. So Jonah recognized that he had been saved. He acknowledged that God did the saving. And he praised God for salvation. So that's what he did. So in this fish, his first response was to wrath. He recognized that he had been saved. He acknowledged that God did the saving. And he praised God for salvation. And that's, that's a challenge for each one of us, to, to recognize where we are at in life. We have to know ourselves, to know what's been going on in our lives, to acknowledge God's saving hand in our life, to acknowledge God's presence. God has been involved. These things aren't involved. There's nothing to them. They're empty breaths, empty nothings. But God is not an empty nothing. He gives us the breath of life. You think all the way back in the Genesis account, God made Adam out of the dust of the earth, and he was just a statue, basically, made of dirt. But then God breathed in him, into him life. So we actually receive our life from God. So God is not an empty nothing. He has the breath of life. He is the breath of life. So recognize where we are at in life. Acknowledge God's saving hand in our life and praise him for all that he's done for us. And so unlike, again, unlike the Old Testament, we don't have any temples or tabernacles. Uh, there's... There's church buildings that we have all over the earth, but this isn't technically God's household. This isn't the house of the Lord. This is the, the church building that we meet in. In the New Testament, we learn from Paul that, that the church, all of us together, all over the world, all of the members make up the body of Christ. We make up the temple of the Lord. So there's a, there's a corporate aspect in which we all make up the body of Christ. But then there is an, an individualistic aspect as well, that your body specifically, as a believer in Christ, is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so there's no, like, building that you're going to go to that God is dwelling in. But if you see a Christian, God is dwelling in that building right there. And so, just like the ancient world, all other religions, all other people who, who serve in those religions and who worship things like this, are empty and devoid of God. They're without God. There's empty breaths. And we have to remember that because, because our mission, our great commission, is to take the gospel to all people, not just the Ninevites, not just the people that we like, but even to the people that maybe oppress us at times or mistreat us or abuse us. 
And so going back to the, the questions that I originally asked, when do we typically try to get our lives in order? And I asked that question because if you're anything like me, I tend to wait till the last minute before I try to get my life in order. And thus, a lot of my pain is self-inflicted. And Jonah brought all this pain upon himself. If he would have just obeyed the Lord first, then he would have spared himself from a lot of this, going through the fish and everything, because he would have went straight to Nineveh. However, he instead disobeyed God. It brought him to this place, and then he prayed. So, so my challenge is, let's not wait till the last minute to get our prayers in order or to fix our lives. Let's, let's seek God now. Let's pray to God now. Second, how do we tend to pray for those who mistreat us or abuse us or take advantage of us? Because we all have people in our lives that have done just that at various times. And we have, we have to pray for them. Because Jesus said when he's on the cross, Father, forgive them for they, they don't know what they're doing. Stephen said the exact same thing God, as he was being stoned to death. God, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. We have to remember that these non-Christians, unbelievers, people in other religions all over the world, they're blinded by the mind. Their, their minds are blinded by Satan. That's what 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says. And so here's, here's the big idea that we have to remember. God is the only one who can save. <laughs> God is the only God who can save. This piece of wood, rocks, iPhones, Google cannot save us. Only God can save us. And it's because there was a prophet that was much greater than Jonah, because that prophet came, died in a literal way, was buried, and rose again. We have the gift of salvation has been offered to us. And as believers, we've taken that. And now it's our job to, to take that to the nations, to offer that to all people. So our lives, in the same way that Jonah's was fainting away, obviously his was a quicker way, but but ours are fainting away faster than we realize often. We're here one day and gone the next. We're like a flower in a field. So we must call out for God's mercy and grace now before it is too late. So if you're not a Christian, please, please turn from your sins. Trust in Christ. Believe that he's enough. That his salvation was good. Um, and that it can cover you. Uh, and it... You know, talk to talk to your neighbor, talk to one of us. If if you are a believer, though, this we have reason to celebrate. Like God saved us, God has saved us, and we're still going through this life just like Jonah is or was. But we have a lot of reason to thank Him and to praise Him. And so Jonah was delivered when he turned to God. Nineveh, as is seen in the rest of the book, was delivered when they turned to God. And we, believer or non-believer, it doesn't matter. We too will be delivered when we turn to God in prayer. Not seeking Him at the last minute, although we can, but we should seek Him now. Um, and so, again, the outline is the grave is conquered by the Lord alone. The grave is conquered by the Lord alone. All the graves are filled. Muhammad, Buddha, all those guys are still in the grave. Jesus rose from the grave. Our prayers go up to the Lord alone. Only God hears that these don't have to use, but God hears because He's full of life. And salvation belongs to the Lord alone. The disciples said in the boat when Jesus calmed the sea and the storm, Who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Salvation belongs to the Lord alone. Let's let's go ahead and pray.